uh, God's people, the Lord increase you. The Lord guide you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. Today will not be another one to be a special one. One you will remember for the rest of your life. The conversation we are going to have today will be the premise upon which your new genius will emerge. Upon which your new influence and authority will emerge. In this world, in the name of Jesus. Pastor, I, I don't know, I've not seen Lagos Church, okay, I get it. I've been wondering. Um, Pastor Sam and Pastor Infer, they're, they're people that have been in my life for so long, but we are just connecting at a level now. And I feel really blessed. Trust me, Pastor. You know, guys, let me tell you something. The last time I flattered someone was 1997. That I said what is not entirely true about how I feel about someone. I don't flatter people. If you, if you are not wise, I will hug you to let you know you are not wise. If you, if you have a body odor, I will hug you even tight to tell you you are smelling. You need to fix this. Who oh, have done that before? I, I don't keep quiet. There are things you can live a thousand years twice and nobody will tell you. And yet, so obvious, but people will love you so much they will allow you to be in that state. I'm not one of those people. At the risk of our relationship, I will tell you the most supreme ideas that I see in my heart. I don't have to say what I don't want to say. The freedom of my conscience is my greatest power. I wake up in the morning to know I dance to the audience of one, and that's my creator. It doesn't make me perfect, but it allows me to be true to myself. You see what I'm saying? Um, the freedom that I know is priceless, honestly. To know that nothing in this world will govern my behavior except my own choice. I have chosen my own slavery. You see, every human being is enslaved to something. True freedom is the ability to choose what enslaves you. I've chosen mine. I'll be responsible for my foolishness and my wisdom for the rest of my life. I don't complain about what I permit. I don't. If you slap me, I don't say, why did you slap me? No. If you slap me, I appreciate it. My next question is how I manage myself that you're able to slap me. It's not about you. If you tell me I'm stupid, I don't say I'm not stupid. I may be stupid. For you to say as an adult, you say somebody is stupid. The assumption is that you have a way of measuring stupidity. And in your mind, I have conformed to that way. So I shouldn't say I'm not stupid. That's arrogance. I should try to know why you said I'm stupid. And if you don't have a reason, I know you are stupid. And I still shouldn't respond to you by, you know, approving your foolishness with my response. So I still have to gift you with silence. That's who I try to be every day. And God helps me. So I don't have to come. You know, when you come to a Sunday service in the morning, part of the protocol of ministry is for you to say nice things about the pastor, you know? Even if they are not true, just say it. Say, oh, you love the pastor, you, you, you must say those things. So most likely you think that's what I'm doing when I say that. But if you think so, it's because you don't know me. If you really know my work and you know the way I do this thing, there are ministries I have gone to, as they call me up like this, I'll just pray and start speaking. Because if I say my mind, <laughs> that may be a seed the church may not recover from. So I have to keep quiet and just pray and do what I want to do. I said all of that to say I don't have to say anything to Pastor. I don't owe him that. What I owe him here is to stand in the office that God has placed me and minister to God's people and go. That's a debt to God. Anything outside of that is not a debt. So I don't have to say nice things to him. I'm saying it because they are true to me, right? You have a great guy on top of your leadership, a great human being. And let's be clear, a great person is not necessarily a perfect person. In fact, a perfect person does not exist. So it's never going to be perfect, neither am I. And I'm going to try to speak to that in my conversation today. But I honor this man, he's an authentic human being, right? I'm an authentic human being. I celebrate you, sir. I love you. I feel really connected 
to this house, I feel really at home. This is so beautiful. Right? Uh, God bless you all in Jesus' name. I have my materials here. They are very expensive. No apologies. A Love Affair with Failure, published by Forbes Books, Wall Street, best-selling book, USA Today, best-selling book, published in the United States, forwarded by Bishop T.D. Jakes. Um, it will change your life. Go out of your way to go check it out. you find incredible wisdom here. I have two other CDs here, Walking in Newness. This one, The Miracle of God's Hand. Three, these three works will change you. This is 20,000 naira. It's not cheap. There's no discount. Uh, you don't need to meet me after I say, sir, the Lord told me, me I need to, no, the Lord didn't tell you anything. <laughs> if you don't have money, your time will come. Just humble yourself and trust the future. And if you have the money, then you go buy it. You are the one we brought it for. Right? So, um, uh, this is 20K. This is 15, 15K. The whole thing is 50,000 naira. Right? If you are buying the whole three, then you get it for 40,000 naira. Smile. <laughs> no, just, it's easy. Just fake it. But go out there and then God will bless you. Just have to do a transfer and then you get a product. And then if you want me to autograph the book, if you get it, then wait after service, I'll autograph it and sign it for you. All right? Um, Jesus, take over now and do what you do best. Transform, heal, lift, elevate. Thank you for clarity, precision in the spirit. Do it the way you do. And bring your testimonies to this moment shifts in the spirit movement from point a to point b whatever those points are for everybody here let it be so and it is so in jesus name we pray amen open your bibles very quickly to some i need my second phone i need to read some verses in romans 12 18 romans 12 18 the bible says if it is possible as far as it depends on you be at peace with everyone. Be at peace with everyone. This says, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Peaceably. Now, in the book of Acts, chapter 24, verse 16. Acts 24, verse 16. So, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and men. Everybody say, before God, and men. before God and men. I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and men. The Amplified Bible says, in view of this, I also do my best and strive always to have a clear conscience before God and man. Hallelujah. Before God and man. So, um, the King James Bible says, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a clear conscience, void of offense towards God and toward men. Void of offense. Amen? Um, then, Genesis in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Genesis in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. And out of the ground and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's go. Verse 10. And the river went out of, the, of Eden to water the garden and the, from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Go back to verse 9. And let me just underscore two things. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, the last one is Ezekiel in chapter 11. I will still use some other scriptures that I will not read out but they are common, like Psalm 23. I will quote some scriptures that you already know. But these are uncommon scriptures that I thought I should quote, and I like. I'm reading the Message Bible, the Message Translation. Then the Spirit picked me up from verse 1 
Ezekiel 11. Then the Spirit picked me up and took me to the gate of the temple that faces east. There were 25 men standing at the gate. I recognized the leaders, Jazaniah, the son of Azur, and Palacia, son of Benaniah. God said, son of man, these are the men who draw up blueprints for sin. Are you here? These are the men who draw up the blueprints for sin, who think up new programs for evil in the city. Who think up new programs for evil in the city. They say, we can make anything happen here. We are the best. We are the choice pieces of meat in the soup pot. Then this is what the Lord said. Oppose them, son of man. Preach against them. So these are the men who create energy in the culture. And I'm going to break all of that down. Are we all together? And the scriptures I quoted in the first service are all intact. This is, this is the last service. Sir. Okay, I need to know. I, I already stretched the time a bit more in the final service. But I'll give you my best shot. Are we all here? So in the first service, the central message is the idea that it is the physical first before the spiritual. Now God made it so. That does not mean the physical is more important than the spiritual. It doesn't mean the spiritual is less important or inferior to the physical. It does mean that the governor of the spiritual realm the monarch of the universe in his design has created the physical. Every time you hear the physical, it's a fusion of three things essentially. Time, space, and matter. Time, space, and matter. That in this sense and in this context, we are speaking about planet Earth. There are some other environment in the galaxies that are physical as well, right? There are physical properties in Mars. There are physical properties you can touch in the moon. So the physical or the natural is not just planet Earth. There are so many natural things in the universe that are not just planet Earth. They are physical things. They are natural things. But in this context, we speak of the physical things or the properties or the energy that defines planet Earth. Now, these properties essentially are defined by time, space, and matter. Stay with me. And so, there are some basic things you have to come to understand for you to stand in your spiritual authority as children of God. And for you to stand in your humanity as human beings. Both of them are two different experiences that are managed by different set of protocols. A phone is managed by a different protocol than a wristwatch. But both of them have protocol. The protocol that manages a car is different from the one that manages um, uh, the television. Or that manages the camera phone. Or the camera at all. Or the phone in your hand right so these are different protocols and the ones that manage the human being is different from the one that manages animals in the jungle are we on the same page but part of the understanding is to understand that there's a protocol to everything and god designed everything to function in a particular way some people have come against the idea of the universe as a reality that is different from God. So when you see people say things like, the universe will do this, or the universe did this, or the universe watch over you, and stuff like that, we easily construct all of that into new age understanding. We try to make a distinction between God and the universe. In the same way that we foolishly make a distinction between God and science. And the arrogance of science, essentially, is to me from the fact that the spiritual people, the so-called people with spiritual understanding themselves, distance themselves for what is happening in the scientific world. And so the scientist does not have any reason or any context to give glory to God. Because essentially, even God's people think they are different 
from science and don't see God in science. Right? Forgetting that every good and perfect gift is from God. And God rules in the affairs of men. He is the monarch of the universe. Everything you call spirituality is yet to be understood um, science. Everything you call science is understood, explained spirituality. Come on now. To you, to pick a phone in Lagos and talk to somebody in New York is science. You take that to Bible days when Moses was here. Then you realize that it's a power. In Bible days, the only way we greet mystery is devotion. What did, what did Aaron bring into the wilderness? Calf. Based on the sudden disappearance of a leader. They were worshipping another god immediately. The miracles that confronted Pharaoh, the ten plagues, I don't think that are not completely strange to us today. And there are things that if they happen in Bible days today, they may even provoke more humility from, 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 from Pharaoh, more than you could imagine, except that God did not design it that way, and God did not write the script that way, and neither was the time able to comprehend those things. For example, if you had shown Pharaoh yesterday, you know, you, know, you can see yesterday. We can, re we can reproduce yesterday for you on a video. And you can see what happened yesterday. You can see what happened three days ago. You can even see 10 years ago. You could see 20 years ago. They couldn't see that in the Bible. If you saw yesterday, it must be a vision. There's no way to see yesterday. So yesterday is gone. In the Bible, it's real. Today is new. So yesterday was impossible to capture. If somebody had come to Pharaoh and said, look at yesterday. Look at you yesterday making a speech in the palace. That is power. They can begin to worship you from there. You don't understand what I'm saying? Because that is, that is so powerful. The Red Sea parted. When the Red Sea parted, you can think that the miracle was the Red Sea parting. The Red Sea parting is not the miracle. The miracle is that a people moved from a point of impossibility to possibility. The drama of the miracle is never the miracle. And why God does miracle all day long, the same yesterday, today, and forever, God does not repeat the drama of a miracle. Because the drama of a miracle is sensitive to the thinking of the people in the time of that miracle. So God will use a drama that the mentality, the culture, and the reality of the people of the time can manage. There are so many other ways God can express that drama, but it won't because of the limitation of the people of the time. So if God wants to part the Red Sea now, he's not going to separate it into two. In fact, there's no way you are going to leave Nigeria to London or America or to, the, to, the, to, the, to, to abroad or overseas without crossing the Red Sea. I mean, you actually cross the Red Sea literally. Literally. You actually cross the Red Sea every time. We've been crossing the Red Sea now for years. Though the Red Sea is not parting, we have found a cheaper, faster way to cross it. Now, you don't see it as a miracle because it doesn't have drama. He has a plane. What you call a miracle is when there's unnecessary energy. A lot of the drama you saw in the Bible is due to the primitivity of the time. It's not that God is interested in the drama. You don't understand what I'm saying? As soon as human beings are ready to experience God at a higher level of technology, God gives them the insight into that technology, moving away from the drama of the miracle and staying true to the miracle. The miracle is when matter is collapsed, time is arrested, space is managed, and people are able to find newness regardless of the limits of time, space, and matter. So every day you are experiencing miracles, but because it lacks drama, you won't even give thanks as you should. There is no difference between you sitting in a plane to London and the Red Sea parting into two. In fact, if there is a difference, it is that one is stressful and primitive, one is more comfortable and easy. Come on now. 
Anything that collapses time, that gives you ease and speed, is a miracle. That's what the phone is doing in your hand. We forget that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that every future technology are already in God today as he's dealing with you in your primitivity. Am I speaking to you? So a ministry in the United States wants to give gas to a ministry in Kano. Gas, as in cooking gas, to a ministry in Kano. In the United States, just in case you don't know, and I believe some of you know, but just in case you don't know, there's no cylinder. Nobody carries cylinder all around. If you want gas, gas is piped. It's already in the architecture of the city. You just build your house and the thing is connected to it. So there's nothing like, ah, oh, it's going to finish next week. Let's go buy another one. Except you don't pay. As long as you are paying, it comes straight into your home. So they don't invest time and energy in monitoring the gas, the, the gas that has, is exhausted or not. They don't invest time and energy carrying it, open, breaking it away, go buy it and bring it back. They don't do all of that. We save that time. The poorest person in America saves that time. The richest person in Nigeria will pay for that time or do it himself. You are going to invest time, energy, and human resource to track that thing. You pay somebody to be tracking it, somebody to lose it, somebody to take it to the gas company, somebody to go buy it and bring it back. That is time, energy, and resources. With all the billions of naira that you have, you are still subject to that. Because you are limited by the socioeconomic reality that defines your environment, regardless of who you are. The energy, the culture that defines meaning in your environment can either limit you or fast track you. Are we on the same page? It doesn't matter how much money you have. Once you are in a primitive environment, the primitivity will tame you on many levels. Now you can stretch hard to use your resources to beat it, but how much can you beat that? Somebody wakes up in the morning in the United States, he doesn't have to think of power. He just does what he's doing. You have to get a generator, support it with inverter, support it with solar, you know, and once in a while everything still fails. Now it's not for, you can afford it a billion times over, but the infrastructure of your environment compels you to stay in that abnormality. Are you on the same page? Yes, you need a house in Nigeria, you need to prepare three years rent. You're not even, you're not even sure you'll be alive in three years. But you go get three years rent anyway, or three years. Your counterpart in America, if they give both of you $10,000 to start a business, your 10000 once you think of rent alone, generator, all your money is gone. Your counterpart in America doesn't have that problem. By law, you can't take two months rent from him. You can only take one month. So he's, he's going to invest maybe $300. You are going to invest three years rent. He's going to invest only a month rent. So from day one, just from rent, rent, he's already ahead of you. He has more cash than you have. So don't be shocked that they are better. It's not that they are more intelligent. It's that the infrastructure that they have invested in releases their genius. The infrastructure you have invested in attacks your genius. Now you are both genius. But what you are lifting with your genius is different. You are lifting stress. They are lifting ease. The propensity that they will produce more result is very high. Not because they are more inten in intelligent than you or biologically superior, but the infrastructures created by human beings in that environment will release them and tame you here. So when they say the American dream is the idea that every talent, gifting, and skill in that environment will be noticed and supported by the system as much as they can. In your country, is the opposite. When you are in America, all you need is audacity, vision, and willpower to get what you have to get done, done. Here is the opposite. You must be ready to die. <laughs> then you will get it done. Now, am I pulling my environment down? No. I'm speaking about the invisible, intangible, intrinsic energy that pretty much harasses us on levels that nobody's accountable for. So what counts is not counted. And what is counted does not count at all. How do you find reading in that type of engagement? 
Am I talking to you? Please listen well. So the guys over there want to now support a village in Kano with the cylinder, with the gas. Though they don't have cylinders, they have a faster, cheaper, easier way of experiencing cooking gas. But to supply the village in Kano, they are going to abandon their superiority, their superior technology and civilization, and downgrade to the level of infrastructure of the village in Kano because the village in Kano and the city in Kano and the city of Kano and the village of Kano, the village of Lagos and the city of Lagos are all subject to that infrastructure. So no matter the love the Americans have for the village in Lagos or Kano or even for the city in Lagos or Kano to supply them gas and be kind to them, they are going to abandon their own superior technology and surrender to the inferior technology of that new environment. So they have to go and buy cylinders and supply the village in Kano or Lagos or the city in Lagos or Kano that cylinder. Why? Because the infrastructure of Lagos or Kano cannot handle the level of technology that is available in America. You see what I'm saying? Now, because you pray to Jesus for cooking gas, and you know you didn't pray to any other God, you didn't pray to any other human being, you prayed only to Jesus, and Jesus responded to you with cylinders, you will then define cylinder as the way God supplies cooking gas. That's not how God supplies cooking gas. God can supply cooking gas in a higher experience, by a higher code and protocol. He is forced by your limited infrastructure to supply you at the level of your infrastructure, not at the level of what is available. Now, if you are not alert and present, if you are not alert, present, and even discerning, you will now begin to recommend your experience of that cylinder to your people as the way that cylinder gas can be experienced. Are we, are we on the same page? That is not how gas can be experienced. That is God coping with your ignorance and supplying you at the level of your infrastructure. There are deeper levels available, but you can't assess. In 1 Corinthians 3, it said, I, do, I want to speak to you and feed you with meat, but I am compelled to feed you with milk because you are babes and you cannot handle the complexity I can have for you to give you more meaning and power. I am forced to deal with you at your level of infrastructure. Now, people pray. That is true for prayer points. Just because you are praying about something in a particular way and you are getting results does not mean that is the best way to approach it. In some other environment, they don't even pray about it at all. They save that time to do something else. So just because you are walking this way, somebody can open his eyes, walking this way, and say, oh, and avoid all these things and make it down without losing one minute. Some other unguarded entity <laughs> can come here sincerely. That's why I tell people sincerity is not enough. Sincerity is not an independent variable. It's a dependent one. Such that if all you have in this life is sincerity, you'll still be poor. It's like hope. Hope is a tool of performance. It does not perform. And if all you have is hope and you will do nothing else, you will still be poor and struggle. Sincerity is not enough. People are sincerely in prison. People are sincerely poor. People are sincerely frustrated. Sincerely raped. Sincerely shot. Sincerely killed. So somebody else is going sincerely. He didn't look well, unguarded. Then boom! Oh! And he fell. And then boom! And he fell. And he said, Jesus, help me! What do you think Jesus will do? What do you think he will do? Hmm? Is he going to ignore him? A loving God will never ignore you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. No matter what you do, he loves you. You know what Jesus will do? Jesus, help me. He's going to come. He's going to come and help you. He'll put iodine. 
He'll clean it up. He put he put plaster and take care of you. Now, because you know, I I shouted to Jesus, and Jesus showed up and he cleaned me up. This is how Jesus saves. No, this is not how Jesus saves. There are higher levels of savior of saving. For example, clarity, insight, discernment. Are we together? Then you now begin to recommend for people. You forgot that there is something about your ignorance that even created the need for this assistance. And this whole assistance can be unnecessary if you pay more attention. And somebody like you is going to come here, see, and say, no. Say, no, this is not here. And keep going. The same circumstance, two parallel experiences based on their level of attention, alertness. Am I talking to you? So, somebody said, you know, God did this, God did that. It's true. But you will never hear this, this testimony in the mouth of some other human beings like you in this world. Telling you that the experience you are have, having is geography sensitive. It's not universal. Meaning that the devil you are dealing with there is himself working with your level of ignorance. On a higher level, it won't attack people with this kind of problem. Is the, the fact that this house is attacking you is proof of your primitivity. In America, the devil does not attack you the way he attacks some people here. He will attack with like freedom. You know, freedom is more is more powerful than ten thousand witches combined. Freedom without rules is a vice. It's like emotion. Without reasoning. If you move from emotion to action, you are destroying yourself. Emotions must be subjected to reasoning. And reasoning must be guided by truth before you move to action. If you move from E emotion to A action, you are susceptible to error. That's how freedom is. It's not enough to just have freedom. You must subject freedom to reasoning. You must allow your reason to be guided by truth before you move to action. Otherwise, the same freedom will destroy you. You say you have been called unto freedom, but who bewitched you? Are we here? Because the freedom all of a sudden is not enough. You are now binded by higher levels of ignorance that make your freedom appear like nothing. And though you are called unto freedom, you still have to be sensitive to the culture of your environment to be sure that you can walk in that freedom. Otherwise, you can be a crying free man. You are free, but still in bondage. The doors are open, but you are still in prison. Am I talking to you? So it's not enough to say I'm born again. Not to say I go to church. I carry a Bible. It's not, those things are not enough. The proof that God is in you is not that you go to church. Church is a means to an end. It is not the end. Am I talking to you? And if you have to be maximized in Christ Jesus, you have to go beyond... All of this small thinking. Somebody was praying the other day and prayed and prayed and prayed. I said, ah, can we change the prayer point? <laughs> because this same thing you are praying about, you are thanking God for all day. Sinners are experiencing it. Without prayer. I, I would not talk to God about some other things that nobody can experience. Except by the working, talking relationship we have with him. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, when the Bible says that it is the physical first, it's telling you that, look, I don't need adaptation. This is a perfect God, incapable of error. Just. So, let's be clear. Whatever it is we came to do on planet Earth is about you. Now, it's all to my glory, it's all to my pleasure, but as far as your functionality is concerned, you are the priority. Am I talking to you? So except a corner of which we fall to the ground, physical, and die, it must respond to that physical law, to that natural law, to find its highest expression. Except it falls to the ground and dies, it cannot abide. And that's the old common sense about why God had to come down 
to fix things himself. At no point, though, did he expect any spirit to fix it. Even before he came, he was still men he was sending. Because those things cannot be fixed by spirits. You don't understand. Can I come down, Pastor? Does the camera see to capture me? Everything is still okay. Good. So, I move faster when I'm closer to people. So, guys, understand this basic thing. Are you ready for this? Yes. Should I stretch your time a bit? Yes. Will you forgive, Pastor? Yes. Don't come next Sunday. <laughs> this is not the fault of Radiating Church. This is my fault. Put it all on me. Next week, you will close right on time. Is this good? Yes. Okay, now listen. Ah, where was I? Yes, I won't be on that. Okay, Spirit of God, help me. Um, anyway, so if you stand, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So part of the journey, I'm trying to find myself, honestly. The physical come first. Yes, yes, yes. It's all about you. You are the priority. Yes. Sorry? Yes. What did I say just before that? Thank you. Thank you, Shege. I have two great guys here. They came with me. They travel with me. Shege, can you start off to be recognized? Sam. Sam. is a fashion. Uh, you can see. And everything I'm wearing, he made it. Right? That's Sam. And Shege is a tech guy, but they do incredible stuff. But they serve me. They serve me passionately. Travel everywhere with me, amazing people. I honor them. Okay, thank you, Shege, for that. What is it again? <laughs> fixed by the Spirit. It can be fixed by the Spirit. There are things in this world that Spirit cannot fix. Now, let me stretch your minds a bit. On this side of heaven, we are so much priority that God's agenda cannot be fulfilled without man. Angels who are right in God's presence have been stunned by God's incredible premium on the human condition. So much that it was documented that what is man that you are so mindful of him? What, what is man? You need to go and read the whole, that book, whole chapter of, 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 of Psalms. With all these things you have done, the stars, the galaxies, the this, the that, how does all of this work? I'm going to pause that. I'm coming back there. So you look at the universe. The universe is God's lower resolution. You know, it's not just Christians who are in the world. There are sinners in the world who don't know God at all, who are cut off from God. There are people who don't know the economics of the kingdom, who don't know nothing about the affairs of state in the kingdom. But before they meet God, they must live. They must exist. They must receive intangibles and tangibles. The universe is God's creation. When you hear, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. That's a loop. That's part of the universe. You see, a loop is, the, in a layman way, a guaranteed, repeated cycle. You see? So when you put a, a song on repeat, that's a loop. 20 years, as long as that machine is working, the song will be on repeat. Am I correct? So that's a loop. Now, there are many loops in the Bible. In fact, when Jesus said it is finished, it's a loop. You see, we started this scientific journey before man understood it. Everything you call speaking in tongues, what do you think it is? Encryption. That's encryption right there. Before they formed the word encryption, we've been encrypting. Scripture already understood encryption. He said, he that speaketh in tongues speaketh not to man, but to God, for no one understands. How be it in the spirit, he speak mysteries. What is an encrypted conversation? What is encryption? Two conversations between ends that cannot be interpreted in the middle of it. So what do you think speaking in tongues is? It's encryption. There's nothing in it. That's it right there. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you understand it as an encrypted conversation, it's easier. For, it's just the way you're on WhatsApp. It's an encrypted exchange between you and the other person. That's how speaking in tongues is. It's an encrypted exchange between you and God. And no one understands. But you are speaking in the spirit. You see what I'm saying? So if you can't see, you see, 
you have to understand that the spiritual realm is not a mysterious realm. God has no plan to be mysterious. God plans to be known. He said the Lord God does nothing without revealing it to his servants, the prophets. Mystery is a creation of human limitation. It's not God's design. God wants to be seen. God wants to be known. God wants to be understood in everyday contemporary life. You see what I'm saying? So when God had to operate on earth, there were limitations. So he created the universe such that while you are dealing with the universe, if you sow, you will reap. It's not that God comes every day to come and make sure that you reap. It's something looped. Anyone that sows, we reap. It's a loop. God doesn't come every day to make sure there is night, there is day. We are angels. We are make it night. We are make it day. We are make it afternoon. No. He looped it once and for all. As long as the earth remained, seed time and harvest, night and day, we never see it. When you eat, you go to the toilet. Loop. When you wake up, you walk, you sleep in the night. Loop. It is finished. Loop. When you are a child of God, you must find yourself in the loop. Otherwise, you are going to be stranded. Because everything has been looped. The reason why we get understanding is to understand our role in the loop. Because the loop and the resource of it are already systemic. God doesn't come down to come and be doing the first things. The first things were done once and for all. He died once and for all. He did everything once and for all. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father and you are there with him. Come on now. Am I helping you? Yes, sir. Stay with me still. This is not too much for you, is it? No, I trust you. I trust, I trust what pastor has been doing here. So I, 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 I won't stay too long. I, I'll try and get out as far. I'm struggling. Trust me, but I'll try. Okay? So, um, uh, so when God has to do anything on the earth, he needs a human being. So he's always asking, who we go? Who is standing in the gap? Did you see all of that in scripture? It's the only way anything can be done on this side of heaven. What do you think is the difference between indwelling of the Holy Ghost and possession of demons? Let me tell you, both of them need the body. Yes. God knows I can't do jack here without these guys. And the best way to really support what they have to do and to get our agenda done is to live inside them. The devil also knows that. That I can't do jack with these guys. And the only way to really get these guys is to live inside of them. So he created possession. God created indwelling. But both of them must stay in man. Now, the devil does not need order. You know, the devil does not need loyalty or profession to get you on his side. Jesus needs order, procession, permission. To get you on his side and to get inside of you the devil does not need to say satan is lord he doesn't need it jesus need you to say jesus is lord devil you can even say i don't believe in the devil i don't believe in god you are still going to hell the devil is okay it's okay don't in fact i don't exist me and god we don't exist as long as you don't say jesus is lord the devil is fine you can say me i'm worshiping this stone the devil is perfect I'm an atheist. There's no God. Whoa. Encourage him. Demons, go and encourage him. Make sure he doesn't change that belief. That's why the Bible says, the road to hell. All beliefs will go there. But the road to heaven is Jesus is Lord. It's narrow. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So the devil does not need loyalty. So he doesn't need permissions. So he can violate. So the devil can come inside a human being without the person's permission. But God won't. Because the spirit of God does not strive with man. You have to allow him to come inside. The devil does not care. Once you don't lock your door, he's coming in. Are we on the same page? But both of them, to rule and to fulfill their mandates on this earth, we need a human being to live inside. It's the same thing. The difference is permission, access, and um, violation, and get crashing. That's the difference. But both of them are living inside a human being. And that is why you have indwelling and you have possession. Do you get the idea? Now, can a Christian be possessed? Let's deal with that real quick. 
No. You can't be a Christian and be going for deliverance. They want to cast demons out of you. Honestly, plus you and the person casting, both of you are already in the hand of the devil. The person casting it out, honestly, is possessed. The person they are casting that from, they are both possessed. Once you are a child of God, you cannot be possessed by the devil. The Bible says, can bitter and sweet water come from the same source? So, <laughs> you think that the Holy Ghost comes inside of you and creates room for the devil. Say, so you will handle this side of his heart. Me, I will handle this side. So, the devil and God are now co coexisting inside one. No! Say, light shine, and darkness does not comprehend it. They don't. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Once you are born again, you can be oppressed by the devil through ignorance, but you can't be possessed. As long as you are born again, your mind of Christ and the human will that you have is enough to beat the devil any day, whatever he brings. But when you are not born again, the enemy lives inside of you and your authority to determine your experience is arrested. Do you get what I'm saying now? So, look at, the, look at the reality. Man cannot function. God cannot function on the earth. Neither can the devil. You see, in Bible days, if you were blind, you were useless to everybody. Let me tell you why healing was a big deal in Bible days. Healing is no longer a big deal like it was in Bible days. In Bible days, once you are blind, there were no blades. If you are deaf, there were no hearing aid. There were no wheelchair. So healing was a precursor to engagement. Healing was a prerequisite. You know when you have a prerequisite course in the university? If you don't pass Echo 202, you can't sit for Echo 302. You see what I'm saying? So in the same way, if you are not born, you cannot live. In the same way, in Bible days, if you are not healed and you have a physical disability, you are useless both to the devil and God. The devil cannot use you. God cannot use you. The only way, the only advantage the devil has is that you are useless. So he can still take that testimony. So if anybody wants to use you in the Bible and you are disabled, you are blind, they must heal you first. That's why healing was a big deal. It's not that healing is how God expresses his power. There are higher ways he expresses his higher beyond healing. But healing is what the civilization of Bible days to handle. Oh, come on now. They can't handle airplane. They can't handle Wi-Fi. They can't handle artificial intelligence. They can't handle machine learning. They can't handle all of these ideas that we are playing with today because at first they need the freedom to even use their hands and their brain. Today, somebody is blind and is a multi-millionaire. Tell me, who is blind? Kobams or his driver? Do you know Kobams and Sukwa? Yes. Do you know him? Yes. Okay, who is blind? <laughs> Himself or his driver? Who is blind? Driver. But who has two eyes? But who is paying who? <laughs> Stephen Wonder, was he wondering? No. There's a guy in Dallas, his name is Nick Giovini. He doesn't have hands, he doesn't have legs. He can pay everybody's salary, probably in this room, not all of us, but some people. Even if you don't work for him, he can afford it. He's a millionaire in dollars. He doesn't have hands or legs. Who is disabled? <laughs> in God, Jesus was asked, who sinned? This blind man. His dad or his mom? Who sinned? He said, no. It's not about anybody sinning. It's for the glory of God. There's a narrative in that that those who are asking the question don't understand. You see, in God... Disability is an unpopular type of ability. Hmm? Disability, to your own eyes and logic, is a problem. To the designer of the human biology and human anatomy, the one that created you knows that it's not a disadvantage. You need as much knowledge to understand that construct as you need to understand. You see, when you are, the governor of Texas does not, does not work, he's on wheelchair. He has a spinal cord injury. He's on wheelchair forever. He's never going to walk again. The governor of Texas. By the way, 
Texas is bigger than Nigeria. And the economy of Texas is bigger than the economy of Africa. So let's be clear. The head of that entity is on wheelchair. He's giving instruction to everybody. If he says, mm, have you signed a document? You can't say, no, you can't instruct me. I have two legs. You don't have two legs. I'm able. You are disabled. Also, <laughs> you are able but taking instruction. So you are calling me disabled when I am leading your life and giving you instruction. It means there is a limit in your definition of able and disabled. There is a true authentic meaning of ability that transcends your logical meaning of disability. Stay with me. I promise you, at the end of today, you will be tortured by your old life if you don't change it. You will, so not, you will want to pray tomorrow morning, you, you won't see the prayer point again. Because all of a sudden you are going to realize that your entire 15 years of so-called spirituality is nothing but burdened religion. What do you think? So you find, you find somebody who is blind today. I've asked Kobams before. I had the privilege of a conversation. He's my friend. And he has said, you know, at times I forget I'm blind. When you see him, ask him. See, at times I forget. Ask Kobams, he will tell you. Do you know Ray Charles? Yes. The American legend. Yes. Do you know that Ray Charles? Have you seen the movie Ray? Yes. You need to see it. Amazing movie. You know when Ray Charles is here, he can hear a cockroach moving on the wall. He can hear, and he can go and pick that cockroach. You know why? What he has lost to sight, he has gained by a heightened sense of perception. Don't you see with your two eyes? You see too clearly to hear that sound. You see, there is a focus in a blind man. You will have to confess scripture, confess, focus, meditate to attend to. When you get out there, you see a Range Rover. You see a Mercedes Benz. The devil tell you, <laughs> you don't have it. Look at you. <laughs> you see a girl. You say, ah, I don't want to look. I bind. I ring. You know, I address that earlier. You are stressing all of that because you can see. The blind man is naturally focused. He doesn't see anything. Now, you see. But the scriptures tell you that what destroys a man is not outside in. It's inside out. God is telling you that as a man thinketh, so is he. He's telling you that your environment is by far more powerful than your environment. That what is going on in your mind and in your world is the superior quality you must not lose. Mm. For you to key into that, you have to cultivate it intentionally. For the blind man, it's natural. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Everything is telling you, the scripture is telling you, go inside of you. For the blind man, is come outside of you. So the difference between the blind man begging on the street and the one who is a millionaire is two things. The parents that gave back to them and what they were telling him and the society that did agree with. There's a girl who used to buy all my products. Amazing girl. And if you follow me, you will know this story. And then she had an accident some years ago. And my office called me to say, ah, Belma, she's got a spinal cord injury. She will never walk again. I said, what? Find her, find her for me. We started talking. By the time I spoke to her, I said, Belma, if you have to fulfill your destiny, you have to go abroad. Maybe without this spinal cord injury, you wouldn't think of abroad. But now, abroad is not a choice. It's a necessity. You will go now, or your destiny is arrested. There's no plan for you here. Over there, even the, the, where you will climb to the restaurant must be provided. In the restrooms, public toilet, your own restroom, your own seat is defined. If you can't create all of those things, you can't be allowed to run a restaurant. Everything in the university, in the dormitory, everywhere is arranged for you. That's your new environment. You have to go there. And then we looked at the school fees tough. It was my birthday. I was 50 that year. I went online. I said, I don't want any gifts. Because when it's my birthday, I get good gifts, a lot of good gifts. I said, I don't want any gifts. Any gift you want to give me, please go and put it in this GoFundMe for this girl. 
This is what we are trying to do. With that and some other things I have to provide personally, she went to London, went to a UK school. She graduated with a first class. First class. And she's doing so well now. If we don't stand up and put our neck in that thing, that's it. A change of destiny by that event. Automatic. It's not because that environment is superior to ours. It's the human beings who live in it and those who live here. It's the history that has defined us. I don't judge anybody. I believe this continent is great, but we have work to do. On Independence Day, honestly, there's not. Go to, go to my Instagram. I've not posted anything. I don't deceive myself. In 1960, we end the right to self-destruct. Indeed, we are independent, but we are not free. Hello? So I'm not going to go there and start talking or, or criticizing the obvious. Nigeria is useless. Well, did you just know that? You just knew? This 60 year old nuisance. And what are you going to do? So talk to me more, not about what you are angry about. Don't talk to me about what is going wrong. Tell me what you want to do about it. Otherwise, shut up. I'm not interested. So I'm focused. I'm building my own corner. Influencing my own corner. That's why I'm here. I turned down a nation building program to be here. I didn't tell you. There was an invitation that I had where well, I'm going to go and speak again. Speak, 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 speak. And I said, I don't mind to do this spiritually. This October 1, I don't mind to spread it here. And correct, connect spirit to spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? So back to the equation. Are you, are you with me? Yes, sir. Do you know that this is, this is what I'm teaching you? I teach the same thing in the corporate world. They pay me a lot of money for it. You are getting it for free. So you need to calm down and enjoy every moment of this thing. Hmm? Thank, thanks to Pastor who has made it available for you. So get it. Now, now listen, guys. So you find that challenge right there and how human beings, human machination changes everything. So nothing is a limitation. Even when you don't have hands, it's not the end. But if your mommy tells you, hey, sorry, you know, they are better than you. You know, we are let's go and beg. We are let's ask for help. You see, a begging bowl is not a pathway to prosperity of any kind. And for every degree of favor that you seek, you lose a level of freedom. Africa has done that for over 50 years. We've received aid more than any continent has received. We are still the world's poorest continent. You don't get anything meaningful by begging. And if you prosper through begging, you know your masters. You know you are not free. You know your masters. Am I talking to you? You say, I have been bought with a price. Be ye not servants of men. So, guys... When God, therefore, if God could not save the world, so God has been sending human beings and sending human beings, and they kept killing them, and it wasn't working. Now say, you know what we're going to do now? It's not that it's afterthought. But we've prepared everything from day one, even slain Christ before the fortune of the world. Whichever this goes, we're going to rescue man. But let's go back to the beginning real quick. Are you back in the beginning? The Garden of Eden was designed in a format. Most people assume that that garden, stay with me, exists in a perfect order. No. Listen, go to Ecclesiastes 1, verse 9. Ecclesiastes 1. In fact, Ecclesiastes 1 from verse 1. Let's go. From verse 1. Let me read. Everybody stay with me. Look at this. The words of the preacher, verse 2. 3. For one generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Go. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. Can you see that cycle? Can you see that loop? Go. The wind goes towards the south and turns around to the north. The wind wells about continually and comes again on its circuit. You won't find new fashion. When you are ready for new, old will appear. Reinvented. Hmm? 
You won't find new anything. Every time you say it is new, it's old happening to new people. Hmm? Every time, there's nothing new under the sun. Go to the next verse. And the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. This is how it's working. Whether it's air court, or it's afro, or it's baggy pants, or it's bottomless, or it's, a, it's all coming back to the same place. Call it music, call it fun, call it leisure, call it science, call it anything. Everything finds its way back to where it was. Go. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. It means that no matter what we do, nobody will finish it. Hello? Now go to the next one. That which has been, this is what I love, is what will be. That which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Pause. What is one word for that which has been? Past. One word for that which will be. So, use those two words to replace this. That which has been is what will be. One word. The past. The past. The past is what? Future. The past is the future. I mean, futurist. People always wonder, how do you interpret things? Well, you don't interpret things by focusing on the future. Because the future itself is not practical. Ay, ay, ay. Listen, listen to this. The future itself is not practical. How many of you have arrived in the future before? I say, whoa, what a future. When you are in the morning, do you know you are in the morning? How do you know? The coolness of the breeze, the daylight, you know you are in the morning. It's a functional reality. It's, it's kinetic. When you are in the afternoon, you feel the heat. You know you are in the afternoon. You feel it. Are we, are we on the same page? It's, you are not imagining it. You are not hoping it is so. It is so. You can prove it. You can experience it. When you are in the night, everywhere is dark. You know this is night. When you say goodbye, somebody is moving. Good life, you are breathing. That's why you say good life. Everything is a functional reality. Will you ever have the misfortune or the blessing of saying good future? <laughs> like you say good morning. Have you ever been in that kind of future like you are in the morning? Today was once a future. Yesterday was once a future. Every time you arrive in the future, you don't say, wow, what a future. What do you call it? Today. Today. Tomorrow is nothing but your imagination. Yesterday is an experience. And every day you live, you create a new past. And people don't understand that. You don't worry about your history. You just live differently today, and a new past has been created. And you will create so many new pasts, it will push the data of your history into the back burner that the only thing you can figure out is the new past you are creating. So, to regulate the history, to alter the course of history, today is all you have. To take responsibility for tomorrow, not to live in tomorrow. So, today does not create the future, guys. That's what the vision I'm speaking. The future creates today. Because the future is not a destination. Yesterday is an experience. Tomorrow is nothing but an idea. Nothing but an idea. It only exists in your mind. Tomorrow is an arrangement by God to keep optimism alive. To keep hope meaningful. To keep engagement in your life. To keep you energized, focused, intense, in practical terms. You will never get to the future. The future only lives here. Now, everything you want to do today is because of the picture of the future here. The future is an imagination that regulates your behavior today. It is what you see in the future that determines what you do now. So it's the future that creates your today. Come on now. Do you understand? So when the Bible says write the vision, it's telling you control today by the future. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if you find people who don't know how to dream, they are the poorest. Adulthood is a scam on many levels. Because part of what it takes away from you is the freedom to dream. Bills arrest your right to dream. And most people don't dream anymore. And those who dream don't even know how to dream. They don't know what a dream is. A dream visits you. You don't make it happen. 
Your job is to host the dream and keep it in your life. You see what I'm saying? Dreams come for you. They gravitate towards you. And you don't dream. Dreams dream you. When you start creating, you are coming into the picture. A body you are prepared for me, O oh Lord. It is written of me in the volume of thy books. Our stories are written. We are journeying into a script. Our will is a navigator. The Holy Spirit tries to keep us on bench and keep us on pitch. Are we on the same page? But whether we like it or not, we have the instrumentality of the human mind. Now, in Christ, the mind of Christ, then by the governorship of the Holy Spirit to create all of that which tomorrow's people will experience. So when you come into this scripture, it's telling you this is how to think, guys. You are the power of it. I don't get nothing done without you. Your prayer points should not be here. When you are praying, trust me, your neck is not supposed to be here. Hmm? You know where your neck should be? Romans 1, real quick. Romans 1, 18. Real quick. Are you here? This is how you should be praying. This is how you pray. I'll tell you why. Romans 1. Let's go. Nebro Sataraba Shanda. I need to go. Romans 1, bros. 18, sir. For the word of God, blah, blah, blah. Verse 19. Because, listen. Because... What may be known. Today is cool, eh? We have left church. Church was first service. Second service is cool. Hmm? Welcome to tell your neighbor, welcome to school. Say it one more time. Because what may be known of God, maybe, what does maybe mean? Future. It connotes future. Anything that may be known is not necessarily on ground. So if it may be known, it is ahead. Do you understand what I'm saying? What may be known of God is manifest where? Yeah. For God has already shown it to? Yeah. Verse 20. Now look at this. Woo! Are you ready for this? Yeah. For since the creation of the world, from the beginning, from the book of eight, from Genesis 1, right? Verse, before verse 1. <laughs> for, for since the creation of the world is invisible attributes are clearly prayed about clearly understood in the spirit are clearly what seen seen how being understood see, between seen and being there is how there <clears throat> anytime you see this word in english language you can you are free to put invisible how so for since the creation of the world is invisible attributes are clearly seen how how are they seen being understood by the things in heaven, things yet to be made, things invisible, things you cannot see, they are made by the things that are made. Ooh. Now look at the next word, evil. Let me tell you the meaning of evil. When you see evil there, it means everything has been considered. Now, the things you think are not inside, they are also inside. So when it says evil, it's saying they are understood by all things that are made. Even the things that you think cannot be inside, they are also understood by the things that are made. What is that? It's eternal power. You want to understand? It's eternal power. Don't look at the things yet to be made. Look at the things that are made. If you see the things that are made, even this eternal power, oh, he didn't stop there. And God heard. So that they are without excuse. Hmm? This is your last day of religion. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Evil is eternal power and Godhead. They are understood by the things that are made. You want to understand his eternal power. It's not heaven you look at. It's this world. You look at sand, weather, shoe, car, plane, the energies, the galaxies, moon, stars. That's what science does. You see, science does not have the indulgence of a heavenly father. So all they have is their human brain to probe and to question. Go to Ecclesiastes 1 real quick. I want to show you something. Go to Ecclesiastes 1. Go to Ecclesiastes 1. Go to verse 9 again. Go down to 10, 11. Go to 10. Go to 10. 
Is there anything of which it may be said, seeing is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. So you say, oh, glass is new. No, it's not new. It's old, happening to new people. The glass is sand, heated. It becomes glass. So sand was in the Garden of Eden. When we understood it and interpreted it, we heated it, we got glass. So you say, glass is new. You say, no, glass is not new. It has existed as sand from the beginning. Come on. There's nothing in the future that is not on ground. Created. Let me show you something. 11. 11. There's no remembrance of former things. There will be any remembrance of the things that are to come by those who will come after. Let me tell you how the people who will come after remember things and create things. Verse 12. I, the preacher, was king, blah, blah, go. I was king over Jerusalem. Remember the, the, the last verse. I was king over Jerusalem. He said, though I am king in the geography called Jerusalem, my physicality is limited, but my spirit is not limited. So it says my mind is not limited. So though I am king in Israel, in Jerusalem, I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning some things, a few things, concerning all that is done under the heaven. So though I am in Abekuta, my mind was arresting everything in the world, checking everything, understanding, understanding everything. I am physically in a locale. I have a universal mind that is questioning everything. I am in Abekuta, but I'm global from Abekuta. Can I shock you? For Moses to do that, he needs angels. He needs Holy Spirit. For you to do that, you have Wi-Fi. Yes. For you to do that, you have Wi-Fi and a phone. You can see New York right now. They said when Jesus is coming, everybody in the world will see him on one spot. That's satellite television. Trust me, it's not that. It's not, mm -mm, all of us, will be, those who will remain, I'm not one of them. But those who will remain, they'll be watching it on their phone. Everybody in the world will see Jesus descending. It's technology. A lot of the spirits and the things that were monsters in Revelations 1. Eh? What do you think? If God has shown a plane to Isaiah, what will he call it? No, I beg you. What will he call it? He will call it a plane. He has no contest to define that. He's going to tell you, I saw a bird with wings as long as so and so, with the sound of a million men. <laughs> when John is documenting revelations, he was seeing the future. The future was being played out. He was documenting the future. He couldn't call those things what they really are because they are not in his contest. Some of those things are artificial intelligence. Some of them are robots. Don't think that one beast is coming at you. Things are already coming at you. They are coming at you in technology. Come on now. Oh, Nebo, Sakia, Nakabo, Shanda. You are not in Bible days, please. You are living in 2023. And the Bible has prophesied that in those times, knowledge will have increased. It has increased, guys. We are not in Daniel time. Daniel doesn't know half of what we know. He wasn't harassed by half of what harassed us. Yes, Do you know what Daniel will go through to see pornography? Do you know what he will go through? Do you know how easy it is for you now? You press a button, boom, two million videos appear to you. Every, free! For Daniel to see that, in fact, it's not possible. The best he can see is to make it to somebody's room. So, is in his first dimension is mono. Our own is multiple. We can see in parallel universes. So we are seeing on a scale. Listen, if do you know it's not possible for Jesus to speak to two million people when he was here? Do you know he couldn't have done? Where would he put them? In fact, where would they come from? Do you know that there was a time in this world we were just one billion? Do you know that as a 1980 something we were just six billion? Do you know how many we were now? 
eight billion. Do you know that one person, Lady Gaga, is being followed by over a billion people? Do you know there's no prophet in the Bible that could enjoy that followership? First of all, the number is not there. Two, by what technology will you speak to them? By what technology? Do you know you and I can do it now? In our times, private and public mean the same thing. In, in 1980, not even Bible days, in 1980, private means private. Public means public. When you are private, you are alone. When you are public, you are with everybody. In 2023, when you are private, you can be with everybody. It's called IG Live. Boom! You go on IG Live. You are alone in your bedroom. And 800,000 people are watching you. You are in private and in public at the same time. A unism was created in that technology. Come on now. So public is now relative. Private is now relative. It's called privatization. The ability of the human mind to have its highest bliss or greatest mis misery alone without human contact. The strength is technology. Are you here? Yeah, I'm taking me home now. So understand when God said in Romans 1, 28, that look guys, you want to understand these things, study the things that are made. Now go back to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, the one we are reading now. He said, I search out by wisdom all that is done under the heaven. Now listen to this. This bodysome task God has given to Solomon, God has given to Jews, God has given to Israelites, God has given to Christians, those who are born again, God has given to who? The sons of man. For what? So that they may be exercised. So, research and development, fact-finding and study are the instrument for the maximization of the human condition. You can't compromise that and expect one mercy of God to help you. <laughs> when mercy of God comes, it's going to kill you into research and study. Hello? And if by whatever reason it saw you us on the first base, by the second base you mature responsibility. Yes. He saved David with catapult and stone. David cannot say, well, I'm going to be using catapult forever. He'll be killed. He said, because your enemy is mono, you can use catapult. Now you are going to become head of the military. You are going to be fighting multiple people. You, how many catapults will you use? <laughs> pa, pa, pa. What are we going to do? He said, so you become a man of sword. So when David was using stone, he was an anointed unprofessional. He had to graduate to become anointed professional by using sword. So don't come and tell me one stone, one, 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 God used stone, stone. God used stone in your rawness. You have to graduate to skill. Hello? Yes, sir. David was not using stone to kill the Philistines. He was using sword, the same sword he couldn't use when the enemy was one. Lion was one. Bear was one. So the technology of stone and catapult could work. When the enemy became an army, he had to use sword. And the Bible said he became a man of war. He was a man of the sword. He killed with so much sword, the Bible says you can't build the temple. You have killed too many people. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, say your son will come and do it. Have I helped you? Yes, sir. Now this is where I'm going. I'm trying to tell you that when you are very special, sorry, when you are very spiritual, is because of your relatability with human beings. If you fail to manage human beings, you will never fulfill your destiny. Everything you call destiny is three things. People, places, and moments. The people you give access into your life and those who denied access. The geographies you allowed yourself to see and the ones you refused to see. The moments you prioritize and the one you deprioritize, that's your life. When death is sure, retirement is guaranteed. Your energy has faded and you are at the departure lounge of life, ready to take the flight. Your life will be proportional. Your peace, your legacy will be proportional to three things. What you did with people, in places, and with moments. That's why the Bible says, listen, don't play with man. As long as it depends on you, don't rationalize it. Be at peace. Only fools make enemies. They can make you one, make nobody one. Pursue peace with all men. Let them call you enemies, it's okay. But you stand in your freedom and seek no offense with anyone. People are the game changers. When they say God has helped him, go and check it. There's a human being there. There's a human being there. Don't get too comfortable. 
Don't say, I know my God. No man can do me something. Men will do you stuff. If you are foolish with men, the Bible says the foolishness of a man subverts his way and his heart rages against God. The foolishness of a man subverts his way. Stay with me, guys. So, when you come into understanding, the first thing to prioritize is the human condition. The human beings that represent that condition and the contents you must engage, the protocols you must submit to to maximize that condition. God cannot help you cough. No matter how much he loves you. He can't help you use the toilet. Cannot, I love him so much. Please, angel, help him sleep. No. You are going to sleep by yourself. Eat by yourself. Spread the perfume by yourself. If you don't spread the perfume, you are going to go out. Your sweat will smell. Human beings will interpret you. They will disconnect from you. They will deny you business just because of your aura. It's your job to manage this thing. Keep it fresh. Eat healthy. Drink healthy. Sleep well. Somebody said divide your life into three eights. Eight hours for sleeping. Eight hours for walking. And eight hours for connecting with other human beings. Hello? 24 hours. Three times eight is what? Live your life like that. Simplify everything. Do you need a bunch of kids to open a door? How many do you need? Listen. When they say secular, secular, it doesn't mean where there's no Jesus. Secular, in fact, there's nothing like secular song. So that the song is edifying or not. When it is secular, it means that thing is a religious idea without social significance. Secular is anything, thought, message, song, anything, environment, system, society, community, as long as religious ideas have no social significance, is secular. So if you are in church on Sunday morning, Sunday morning, like this, preaching in the name of Jesus, telling Bible stories, and what I'm teaching has no social significance, though I am in church, preaching in the name of Jesus is a secular message. It's not a kingdom message. Secular message at best is message to the soul. Kingdom message is message to the spirit. And people can keep your soul inspired without not touching your spirit at all. There's a difference between a sensation of victory and an experience of it. Have you had malaria before or fever? You, were, you can't eat, you were shaking, then they took you to the hospital. Ten minutes to the hospital, you just started feeling well. Have you noticed it? You started feeling cool. But then you go to the hospital, it's as if you are well. Everything you just calm. You are looking at the doctor's door, that's why. You know why? You are in an environment with an energy of healing. So that your trust capital was, on, was released in that environment. You trust the environment. So there is a resonance between your own thinking and that environment that produces a sensation. It's not healing yet. If you want to test it, say, I don't need the doctor again. Let me go. The relapse, you will suffer. You won't even believe it. You know when the Bible said the power of God was present to heal? If you're in that environment, you'll, be, you'll be feeling well, all right? You have, you have not been healed. But just the energy of healing, already feeling well. You know, you can come to church as well and get a sensation of victory. Mm. Not an experience. Yes, okay, so let me tell you now. See, what you are done today is sensation. Yes, you have to go and convert. Yes, if you just go home and say, ah, man, the message today was powerful. 14 days is gone. <laughs> what, did the man, what did the man of God say last week? <laughs> Powerful. Man, that word. Man, it was word. Uh, that's it. Apply. You have to keep it transferable, usable, rewardable. So how do you do that? You go back to it again. And listen. And listen. Asking only two questions. Only two. I'm giving you practical tool for transformation. Only two. What do I need to stop doing? What do I need to begin to do? That's all. From this thing I'm hearing now. Please, when you get home and you are listening, don't go and carry be ready wisdom kill. Don't have to have a document. The power of the party, the power. Wow. <laughs> the movement of the movement cannot move. Oh, wow. <laughs> Please, that's not the solution. Don't even write anything. It's okay. Just divide your shit into two. From what I'm hearing now, what do I need to stop doing? What do I need to begin to do? That's the energy of transformation. 
The goal of knowledge is no recall. The goal of knowledge is transformation. If whatever you learn in church, outside church, in a seminar, in a conference, or in school, or by a lecturer, or your academics, BSc, Masters, PhD, whatever you are learning anywhere, reading a book or anything, if you can't dimension it into what I will stop doing, what I'll begin to do is sensation. It's not victory yet. Have I helped you? So, prioritize people. You are teaching in church. You are listening to a message. What does it have to do with climate change? LGBTQ. Global warming. Your career, your boardroom tomorrow morning. That's why I don't judge people who tell Bible stories, but I, I avoid it. Because a lot of times, I can't situate it. Some of them are too dramatic for me to dive into this reality. Because the devil I'm dealing with in 2003 is very explicit. Very, very, it's not coded at all. It's coming at you direct. Right? You must have answer now or you are stranded. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't tell Bible stories. Let's be clear. I'm not saying that. I'm saying whatever you are listening to, Bible story or whatever story, it has to come down to the actions you will take. The Holy Ghost will not help you sleep no matter how much he loves you. A snake will not come in here now. Coming right at you. you say, oh, oh God. Father, in the name of help me kill the snake. The least you can do, at least run. You can't stand there. The snake bites you without your knowledge. There's grace. You didn't see it, you were just sleeping. So they come, cham! No. You, it will bite you, it will hurt you. They put poison in your food, it will not kill you. The moment you say, thank God for this food, everything inside is combated. Everything inside. As long as you are not aware. But they tell you, there's poison in this food. Say, huh? My God will save me. Bring it. That's called, you shall not test the Lord your God. Remember the guy that went to jump to the lion's den in Ibadan? Remember what happened to him? And every day we are testing God. Now let me finish. When the Bible says the physical first, it's telling you, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. I'm closing now. And give to God what belongs to God. I made Caesar. I'm not interested in what he has. It's not my problem. If he's going to be a bother to me, I won't make him. So give to him what belongs to him, my friend. I'm not bothered about that. I don't have low self-esteem. I'm not intimidated by Caesar. I can't be intimidated by my own creation. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Just give to me what belongs to me. You know what the problem is? People don't know what's on the list of what belongs to Caesar. We don't know what's on the list of what belongs to God. Religions blind us. So you know what we do? We give to Caesar what belongs to God. We give to God what belongs to Caesar. That's the story of our prayer points, of our belief points, of our faith structure. We are believing God for what Caesar can, what you can take from Caesar like this. I pray, God help me. So you see people's prayer point, Lord, a house, visa, visa. Hi. Do you know what that is? Jesus died, resurrected, prayer of agreement, gift of faith, the working of miracles, diverse kind of tongues, interpretation of tongues. The gift of prophecy, designing of spirits, eh? angelic support, all of that for visa. Lord, give me visa. And then your counterpart in the world is not praying to anybody. Organize his life, get the passport, get his visa. And it doesn't come to church to torture anybody in the name of testimony. <laughs> Listen, a car is not a testimony. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When you are coming to church to testify of car, you are celebrating your escape from poverty. It's poverty that is disturbing you. That is why you come to church to say, of all the exploits in the world, people have changed kingdoms, shot the mouth of lions. People have turned the world upside down. What you want to do with the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells inside of you and all he's doing is pursuing visa. And you want to buy a car and sit in business class. Wow, somebody made the plane. Somebody owns the plane, and it's not born again. They don't lay hands in Google. Come on. They don't do prayer of agreement at, at Microsoft. Hmm? Your life is incomplete without them. When you finish now, you're going on IG. Well, Mark Zuckerberg is not born again. But <laughs> we can't even do service without keyboard. What about that? We need to come home and say, what is the stake of the kingdom in the affairs of men? And what is our role in it? Kingdoms are here. This hand, this brain under God. 
That's how we change everything. We have to participate in the affairs of the world now. I prophesy to you in the name of Jesus. You see, the next seven years is key. The next seven years of your life is key. Everything you have done before now, good or bad, wise or foolish, is forgiven. Trust me. It doesn't matter. If you did nothing in the last three years, it's okay. It's okay. But the next seven years, you will do something or be stranded. The next seven years, seven is the number of perfection. 2030, December 31st, everything will have changed. I kid you not. You are going to look back at the world and see something completely different. As of 1982, we didn't have a lot of things. Typewriter was ruling everywhere. There was no digital phone. There was camera phone. We thought we've seen the world. Look at where we are. If you are above 50, you saw two worlds. You saw the analog world. You are seeing the digital world. We saw everything change. We saw TV as a cupboard. Now we see TV on walls across our rooms. When we're growing up, it's only one TV in the sitting room. Now you can have one in your toilet. Everything has changed. By 2030, you will not see the world as it is again. Listen to me. It will be defined by four things. Number one, the rise, sorry, the fading of powers and voices as we have known. And if you open your eyes since 2020, you will see there's a fading. Power is changing. The voices that represent it are changing. It will continue to change. If you are one years old now, in 30 years, you will be 31. If you are 10 years old, in 30 years, you'll be 40. Every human being on the face of the earth today, from one year old to anything, in 30 years, you will either be at the departure lounge of life, you'll either be a full-blown adult, full-blown in your 50s, 40s, or 60s, or you'll be at the departure lounge of life, ready to take the flight, or you'll have taken it. If you are 20, you'll be 50. If you are 30, you'll be 60 count your life like that. Teach us to number our days so that wisdom can enter our hearts. Because if you don't number it, wisdom will run away from you. If you are 40, you'll be 70. I was talking to a young man the other day. I said, you know you are 65. Say, Why am I 65? I'm 35. I said, you, are not, you are not 35. The future is 30. So you are fighting your father. This is how you'll be fighting. You are 65. It's when you begin to see your friends in obituary when you know that you are old. Hello? Count the numbers. In 30 years, if you are 30, you are 60. If you are 40, you are 70. If you are 50 like me, you'll be 80. I'm 52, I'll be 82. If you are 60, you'll be 90. How many 90 year olds do you know? How many? Go ask your dad. How many of his friends are still alive? Why? 90 something. Most likely, by the time you are 90, you are gone. I told a very close senior 70 year old of mine. I said, sir, with due respect, with due respect, with due respect. Everything you are saying, harassing, you was harassing somebody, harassing somebody. I said, you are harassing a different generation. It's just 31. You are over 70. Tops, 15 years, you are gone. <laughs> you are gone. You don't need this aggression. You need humility. Mm. Worry about your legacy now. Mm. Your clock is here. Stop doing this thing. It's not going to favor you. That's the future. That's your, that's your next generation. That's your legacy. That's the guy that will determine the life of your son. You know what I do? There are some people I show favor, big favor, that change their life. They come to me and say, I want to give you this. I say, I don't want. Let's have a covenant. I gave back to a son in my 40s. All my friends are done with school. I, mean, I see my dad an 11 year old. I said, so let's have a deal. Most likely, by the time my son is 45, 40, I won't be here. Because if I do another 30 years, you'll still be 39. If I do another 30 years, I'll still, still be 39. I say, but well, you are much younger. When he's 39, you'll be in your 60s. You'll be his father and his uncle. Promise me that by this favor, before God, if my son will never call you. He will never need you in Jesus' name. But if for whatever reason he needs you, you will answer. And you will remember this favor. And you will do it to him. Can we agree on that? Before God. You may not even be faithful to it, but God will hold you accountable. Deal, deal. Take your money. I don't want it. Just let's sign. I put this. When my son is a particular age, I'm going to give him that list. <laughs> I'm 
These people, they may not behave. Just know that they hold you. And this is why. What do you want to give me? I don't want. But it can come for my future. Because right now, I don't focus on opportunities. I focus on legacy. Legacy. I don't do opportunity investments. As those people who know me. If you say, sir, can you give us um, 20 million? You want to we'll give you 10 million back. I don't do that kind of investment. I'm done. I did that in my 30s. Now, you want me to invest? Give me equity. Give me 5% of the business or 20%. I can will that to my children. If you give me 10 million back, that's money. We'll spend it. But if I take a stake in the business, even when I'm gone, my son can say, come and sit on that board. He can have that share. That's legacy. You see the difference? Opportunity, investment, legacy, sensitive investment. It's priceless what we have done here today. God has done a thing here. Do you understand what I'm saying? Rise to your feet, everybody. Rise to your feet. I want to give you instruction. Rise to your feet. Please don't sit down. Guys, the fading of powers and voices, as you have known, the rise of powers and voices, as you are yet to know. Therefore, the rise of underdogs. No name boys and girls, men and women, rising to promise, prominence and authority and influence at a level unprecedented. Then, lastly, the rise of the church. Between now and 2030, you are going to see graces unimaginable. Stop hustling. Position yourself. Goodness and mercy shall not be before you to be pursued all the days of your life. Goodness and mercy shall follow you. Your dreams are gravitating towards you. Everything you want is following you, but you are following it. You are chasing what is chasing you. You are looking for what is looking for you. So when you are there, it's gone. When it's there, you are gone. You are chasing each other, missing each other all day long because you are hustling, not positioned. Stop running around. Girls, I give you counsel. Let nobody put their hands under your blouse. I'm not a mother, so breastfeeding adults. You need to calm down. This thing God has given you is to be preserved. There's a prince ahead of you. He's coming. He will find you. Stay with God. Trust him. Believe your own story and trust the future. God above the two. This hand, this brain under God, it will guide you. Men, young men, calm down. All these dance steps is not the way. Land, labor, capital, entrepreneur, you can't see dance step there. But that boy can't save you, I promise you. You know yourself. You know your mom. You know your dad. They work so hard. They're selling papers over at the junction, giving them their best shot. You know your dad is a civil servant, trying his best, sent you to school. Trust him for your reward. Don't get carnal. Show up. And take the mantle of responsibility. Stop jumping around. Let them jump. Listen. If you join them, you cannot lead them. Let them do what they do. Stand alone. Be criticized now. Let them say you don't know what is happening. Let them call you a slacker. Time will tell. In time, humility will come. Everybody will find their level. Hmm? For now, you have only three things. This hand, this brain, under God. Can you all say after me? This hand, this brain, under God. One more time. One more time, please. Can you say it louder? Can you tell your neighbor louder? This hand, this brain, under God. One more time. This hand, this brain, under God. You need a brain. Let me remind you. Your most spiritual organ is your brain. It's not your spirit. Eh? It's not your spirit. Your spirit. If your spirit is dead now, you can still be a millionaire. Is Jeff Bezos born again? By scripture, it's not a reprobate mind. Is he born again? Is he a billionaire? Is his spirit dead? Yes. He's dead. 
But is his, is his soul alive? Yes. Has he ruled the world with his soul? Yes. So even if your spirit is dead, you can still have a life. If your soul is dead, you can still have a life. If your hands are caught, you will still breathe. If your legs are caught, you will still breathe. Once your brain is dead, your spirit is dead. Every part of your body. Listen. Once your spirit, your brain is dead, you are useless to God, you are useless to the devil. It's called a vegetable. No part of you can work it. You just be looking. You are like a table that is breathing. You are like a chair that is breathing. No other purpose. You are just looking. You can't fulfill anything. You can't fulfill destiny. The only praise the devil has in that kind of a soul is that it's useless. How can you then tell me that a brain that no part of your body, spirit, soul, and body can function without is inferior to any other thing? The mind of Christ. I don't think that works. Sorry. This brain, who gave you? The devil. So you think God gave you anything that is useless? It is disrespect to design to appreciate any other thing away from your faculty. Everything counts for your ultimate. Your brain is a spiritual organ. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? You will hear God. Your chance of hearing God because your brain is working. If your brain is not working, you can't hear God again. And even if you hear God, it's useless. You can't move your hand. You can't move your leg. You can't move any part of your body. So your brain must be working. Listen. All this brain is key. Let no spirituality deceive you. This brain is needed. When God is ready for you, he will touch your brain. He will touch you. He will touch your Get your body working. Are you hearing me? There are people in this room. You will see deeper than the internet can never show. Healthcare will find redemption in your idea. The next level of healthcare in this country will come from you. Amen. The people in this room, we thought we've seen politics. Your own political ideology will change this country and turn it on its head. In this room, Amen. you will be seen by those who matter. Amen. Listen, you won't be perfect, but you will do the job. Amen. Did you hear me? You won't be perfect. Listen, the people in this room, we've seen fashion. We've seen fashion, you are coming. We thought we've seen fashion. You are coming. Yeah. When you come, Paris we know. Yeah. New York we know. Yeah. You'll be selling Africa at a level different from what we have seen. Yeah. You'll be bringing dollars from all over the world to headquarters in Abekuta, yeah. to headquarters in, Lo in Lagos, to headquarters in, in Bini Kirby, in Accra, in, in Johannesburg. You! You! How many dance steps have we seen? There are still more to be invented. You guys will do it. Amen. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead draws inside of you. It will change the world through you. Amen. Start thinking big ideas is free. Faith costs nothing. Dreaming doesn't cost a dime. Optimism is cheap and free. Enthusiasm doesn't cost a dollar. They are all free. Somebody said, God, I need money to do this. And it starts with what you don't need money for. Your imagination. Start dreaming and the universe will conspire and bring everything to you. The universe listens. God made it. And God is aware of everything you are experiencing. Are you here? Change the game. Don't, don't, don't pray for shoes. Don't pray for suits and, and air and perfume. They are additions. Seek first and his righteousness. All other things shall be added. Are you hearing me? Let me give you a key. Stay in the word. If you don't know how to do anything, stay in the word. Read the Bible every day. Every day. Don't try to read 200 chapters. Grow. Just take a verse, but don't do through it. I'd rather have you a lot praying to the Holy Ghost to help you a lot to read one verse than to have you try to read 10 chapters and dozing and sleeping. I'd rather have you pray for one minute a lot than to doze through 30 minutes. Hello? Faithfulness in little brings more. Be faithful with a minute. Be faithful with a verse. You won't even know it will become so sweet. You go to two verses, two chapters, three chapters, four chapters, ten. I finished the Bible with all humility from Genesis to Revelation over 40 times. By the end of this year, I've finished it twice again. 
three chapters a day, five on Sunday. You finish it every year. Six chapters a day, ten on Sunday. You finish it every six months. Twelve a day, twenty on Sunday. You finish it every three months, guys. Think about it. Finish it once and let's compare notes. When you start, hmm, you will be shocked at what you say by yourself. You will say what you didn't study and you will know I didn't say that. I didn't study that. That's God. That's the fullness of the word producing. Then you know what will happen? Your friends will start taking, start taking a second look at you. Because the things you do and the results you manifest will shock them. But the last people to believe you will be your family members. When they start looking at you, something bigger that you can ever imagine is happening. That's your story. Are you here? Stay in it. Just stay in the word. Read other books. Read other chapters. Do whatever you have to do. But don't ever prioritize any material outside the word of God, above the word of God. I read wide, but I don't joke with the word. I can't. Listen, I read the book of Ecclesiastes, a chapter every night before I go to bed. No matter how busy I am, the last thing I do is the book of Ecclesiastes. It's 12 chapters. You finish it every 24 days. Twice. Do it. Those are the point of contact or wisdom in scripture. Stay in it. The book of Proverbs is 31 chapters. If you take one every morning. One. Every 31 days you will have been done with it. At the end of the year you will have read it 12 times. In Ecclesiastes, if you take one every night, at the end of the year you will have taken it 24 times. Let's compare notes. See you in one year. I'm saying that's your minimum level. You cannot go to any other thing. Take those two. Stay in the New Testament. I, I sit down and finish Psalm 1 to 150. On, on one seat. I just read. When I'm bored, I'm in God's word. Please stop touching my head. Stop, give me your handkerchief. <sighs> if it's by touching people, I should have. Why did I wait for nine years for a child? I should have taught somebody this one and just get a child. I spent 12 years in the university trying to get a degree. 12 years. Extra years. Eight. No, it's not, it's not that I, I was in a spiritual training. I was failing. I was stupid. And I was failing year after year with carryover upon carryover. Eight years of extra. Plus the first for making 12. Look at us now. You know what the recovery was? The recovery was what? The word of God. We got born again and we went mad. By that madness, we have come this far. They don't call fools to take this microphone. They don't. In fact, if you give this microphone to somebody else, you'll be surprised. All of you will have left. I say that humbly. You are all stuck here. Because the anointing of God is working on a human being. Listen. It's not about me. I knew when I was foolish. I never smoked cigarettes in my life. I never drank alcohol. They were too light. I was dealing with marijuana and above. I was salivating uncontrollably, drooling. My life was a mess. Jesus fixed everything. He would take the poor from the dunghill and set them among nobles. There are kings in this room. The only reason why your story will not be it is because you allowed it. If you know what is written of you, you will never suck up to any human being again. You beg and cower because you don't know what is written of you. You are the child of the king, the son and daughter of the monarch of the universe. He has a plan for you. There are plans of good and not of evil to bring you into a future and a hope. Do you know, with all the time we have spent here, I still call this message short. <laughs> I can talk to you now for the whole of the day. I will not lack what to say. Because out of your belly. Have you heard me? What are the two things I, should like, I would like you to copy in me? Should I tell you? Never copy anyone. Copy principles. But if you have to copy people, copy this. Particularly people you see on this type of stage. Stay in the word. Copy that one. Go and copy it. Stay in the word. Be the habit around staying in the word. Hmm? When you come to church, you will just come for deeper clarity and a new dimension. We won't teach you anything new. Eh? The people in this, as pastor is listening to me, there's nothing I'm saying that is new to him. Pastor, am, am I lying? No, 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 seriously. What I'm saying is expanding at best because you stay in the word. That's what you be, guys. That's what you be. 
Because once you taste the water from him, you will never be thirsty again. Fill my cup, Lord, and lift. That's not your own song. You are ready. No, you are filled already. That song unbelievers should be singing. Or those who don't know God. Your own cup is filled. He said, for if the water that I give, you will never test again. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Now receive grace. Amen. Receive grace. Amen. Receive the grace of God. There are people in this room, God will raise you to the leadership of this house. When you come here, God is speaking to pastor now about a different type of church. The next 90 days of pastor, you'll be downloading a new expression. The men that will execute it, the women that will execute it are here. Your own will be different. It won't be church as we know it. It will be church in a dimension we have not seen. It will be God in the city. It will be church in ways we have never experienced before. It has come. Now receive it. For those of you in ministry, receive it. Receive it right now. The meaning of pastoring will change. The meaning of prophet will change. The meaning of apostle will change. It won't be about titles anymore. It won't be about the traditional things anymore. It will be newness in a way unimaginable. Evangelism of the future is culture shaping. It won't be about crusades and tracts. It will be about manifesting at a level to unlock the humility and curiosity of the world to pursue your source. That's where it's going to happen. It is done. Do you believe it? Please start praying in the spirit. Just pray in the spirit. No, pray in the spirit. Just take it in. Soak it in. Soak it in. <laughs>